All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Good morning. My name is Brad Howarth. I'll be leading you through our panel discussion now. So I'll do it sitting down because it'll be easier too. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I was actually thinking when I got invited to come along and chair this panel, what a fantastic experience it would be. I don't know if any of you ever play fantasy football, <laughs> but this is kind of like fantasy football for me. And I essentially have basically my entire forward line here. Put Michelle Simmons, maybe a couple of others on there, and we have most of the team packed out. So it's a brilliant opportunity for me to now get here to, uh, to sit and interrogate these wonderful minds that we have available to us. So uh, I work as a, well, for my sins, I actually started off as a journalist, uh, having originally failed engineering um, back at RMIT in the early 1990s. Um, and as a result, I try and get away from numbers as far as I possibly can and focus more on words. So when I was asked to, uh, to look at this panel, then I, I looked at the title and we looked at the idea of winning the AI race. And it's interesting that we should perhaps talk about the notion of what a race is and what a race involves. A race generally involves a favoured competitor, the sort of person maybe that we are looking to see their progress throughout that. And we'll assume in this case that that favoured competitor would be Australia and we're looking at will Australia be winning in this race. We look at the notion of a competing field and therefore we choose to understand who our competitors are and what our relative position is. A race often obviously involves the notion of a finish line. And I think when it comes to the race of AI, that finish line is probably something that lies a long way into the future. And therefore, it's perhaps not something that we'll ever actually cross. So therefore, we need to understand what our comparative positioning is within the field. So to discuss these ideas, I've got this wonderful panel here, and I'll introduce them to you now. For those of you that aren't familiar, on the far end, we have Adrian Turner. Um, Obviously quite familiar to many of you from his role at Data61 over the last few years, now out on his own, being the entrepreneur that he was born to be. Sitting next to him, anyone who was here this morning obviously will be very familiar with Genevieve Bell, um, Principal Scientist in Strategy, uh, sorry, that's, I'm reading the wrong one. I was liking it. <laughs> Distinguished <laughs> Professor and Director of the 3A Institute, yeah. ANU and Senior Fellow at Intel Corporation, Dr. Stefan Hakovic, did I get that right? You did, how did you know how to do that? because you told me, right. and I listened, <laughs> no one knows and I practiced. Yeah. All right, I'll yeah, mess it up every time it. from now on though, but we got that right. Um, principal scientist in strategy and foresight at CSIRO, and stepping in at short notice, Susan Key, research director in cyber physical systems at Data61. You might have noted from your uh, agenda that uh, Emma Martino Treswell was meant to join us. Unfortunately, she hasn't been able to do that. So thank you, Sue, for stepping in. So I've set up the principle here, I guess, of discussion around the concept of a race, and I'm particularly interested in this notion of where do we actually sit within the field? But if we're gonna be discussing AI, probably what we need to do is, is set a grounding of what we are actually discussing. So Genevieve, I might throw this to you in the first place, and to misquote Raymond Carver, what do we talk about when we talk about AI? Wow, well, that's always a good question. I sometimes think there are probably as many definitions of AI as there are people in any given room, and it occasionally runs the risk of being a bit like innovation. Everyone talks about it, no one actually means it. Uh, listen, I think there's a couple of different ways you need to think about it. One is that you can't ignore the fact that we have nearly 100 years of science fiction telling us what AI should feel like, and it's the bit that is the sort of scary robots coming alive and nothing good will come of it. The notion of a fully sentient, fully thinking system of systems, there's that piece. At a technical level, I mean, I always think you have to go back to the first definitions of AI, which were really about computational systems that understood human language, that were able to understand symbols and abstractions, so effectively see, so listen and see, and then be able to perform tasks that humans could perform and learn for themselves. I think that's, a, for me, a useful definition. I'd say by the time we sit in 2019, AI is often also sometimes used as shorthand for machine learning, for different kinds of algorithmic work. I think you probably shouldn't ever talk about AI divorced from a context of data. So what fuels it, what does it need, what does it produce? I think those are conversations that probably should shred a little bit, thread a little bit more together. Good. Anyone do better than that? Shorter. <laughs> the, the only extra, in our work on AI, we often differentiate between narrow artificial general intelligence, uh, which is like the strawberry picking robot, which can reach a very complex task for a, a computer to solve and robotics. Um, but it is solving a specific task versus artificial general intelligence, which is the robot without clear objectives that helps design its own objectives. So AGI is something we haven't really been able to build a tech roadmap out to within the 2030 time frame for a lot of our work, not to say it, it can't happen, but we're more focused on narrow general intelligence and the only sort of other addition, I, like Genevieve, I'd see machine learning pretty central to artificial intelligence, but it's the ability of the machine to learn and problem solve and design 
its strategies without explicit guidance from a human being. That's, that's what's getting all the world's countries out of bed on AI, is that capability that the machine can generate its own solution to a problem without explicit guidance from us, which takes us further and further out of the picture. Got it. All right. I think we've got some reasonably good definitions there. I won't go to everybody to define that because, as Genevieve said, we could be here all day defining. The preposition of a race, though, as I said, any race that's being run, we want to know our position within that race. But my question here is, what is the metric that we should be looking at when we try to assess our comparative strength in AI and whereabouts in the field we might be? There's a very obvious headline metric that gets played out quite often, which is level of government investment. But it's not a metric that looks particularly flattering in Australia when in comparison to what we might see happening in Germany or China or other places in the world. So how should we be assessing our relative positioning when it comes to the AI race? Sue, do you want to I actually that? think that's a pretty good metric, and I guess the question then is, do we qualify to enter the race? Have we paid our ticket? Mm. Stephanie? I'd say it's how much, it's, it's true, part of it, but I'd say how much useful application we can see of AI within the Australian economy to boost productivity and make our lives better would be a really important one. How, how much evidence can we get that Australians are getting their lives improved by the use of AI? Massive opportunity to use AI in earlier diagnosis of cancer. You know, the 150,000 Australians that are diagnosed with cancer, a significant number of them, late stage. AI, com computer vision used in skin cancer can bring that forward. That's a case of useful application of AI. So the amount that we can see it doing that, I think for me is a core metric. And then depth of capability and where we're pushing the, the boundary forward. But you know, this, we don't have to win this race everywhere. We can afford to lose in some places and let the tech get developed offshore and then select where we want to be the world leaders in it. Well, I think a nuance to what Stefan has suggested, though, is that we need to be able to distinguish between the benefits that have accrued from technology that we've developed here as opposed to those imported technologies. Because, yes, we could import technology to do some of that medical imaging work, and that's great, but how much more benefit would we get if we had been developing the technology to do that here? And I don't think we have a good metric on that. Adrian, so I can sense you want to jump in there. I, I, I do, because inherent in your question is it's a race and there's a winner in a race and that there's uh, the time matters, the speed matters in a race and I think we should also be questioning why is that so around AI and the reason it's so is touching on Genevieve talking about the importance of data. It's the importance of data but also data economics and the current vertically integrated platform model favours scale and favours first to scale. And, um, and, and you see that in terms of, you know, the big companies getting bigger and seven of the top ten companies by market capitalisation now being, in the, in the world, now being platform companies. So I think an interesting question and certainly one that Data61 is very focused on is, is there a different model? Like, is there advancements in machine learning, federated machine learning, privacy preserving machine learning, um, that could unlock a different sort of data economic model um, that don't have these winner take all dynamics, um, which would, I, I actually think is necessary for, for more equi equitable sharing of, of wealth in a, in a networked and AI driven world, but also for a middle power like Australia, critical to think differently about the underlying and resulting economic structures too. Cool. I mentioned at the top that government funding is one of the metrics we often look to, but there is obviously a lot of focus on what government is doing in Australia and the support that government is providing, but you just identified that 10 of the best companies in the world are heavy users of AI, so surely there's a very strong impetus for the commercial sector to be playing this game as well. Do we see that in Australia? Do we see the level of investment from the private sector really matching what private organisations are doing in other parts of the world today? By and large, no. No, our corporate sector is not spending close to Amazon spent 34 billion Australian dollars, 31, 30 billion dollars on AI, on research. A lot of it is in AI. Alphabet, Google, Microsoft, um, IBM, similar sort of expenditure levels. We're not seeing, even when adjusted for the size of the companies, we're not seeing Australia's largest companies spend at that level. So we're not stoking the future pipeline of 
capability for Australia with R&D investments to the same extent these other companies are. And ultimately, Amazon can come and compete against Coles and Woolies in the Australian retail sector with advanced AI capability, natural language processing capabilities and data science, which lets it do things a lot more cheaply and more efficiently. And that's the sort of challenge that we're going to continually get. If we're not developing R&D capability, we're going to be subject to offshore competition. So what I think it is a challenge in that Australian, from my point of view, you know, the ASX 250 are not investing in R&D and developing AI, deep AI capability that builds their business out to 2030 anywhere near to the extent of the tech giants that we can see offshore or large European companies from a, from a lot of different sectors. So we've looked at R&D data and that's a pretty strong story that we get back is that the percent of revenue Australian companies invest in R&D is fairly small and that would, that would apply to uh, AI as well. And I think as we look to the longer term future, there is a, a negative consequence for Australia for that. I think there's, um, we, we need to make a distinction though, because a, a lot of um, the deployments today are around driving operational efficiency and doing things that we do today, but doing them faster and cheaper. I think what's super exciting and compelling about what Genevieve speaks about is when we start thinking about what new possibilities exist, um, what types of new value can we create and what, what are the implications societally, economically, um, and what we need to be careful about with these numbers is if, if I'm deploying an SAP ERP system that happens to be using machine learning and I get quizzed, am I you know, deploying you know, AI? Um, a company is gonna go, yeah, but are they unlocking and creating new value where it didn't exist before? You know, maybe not. And I think that's Australia's opportunity here is to think about net new value creation. Good. And there's some ways of thinking about that question differently, right? Which is to say, it's not all about next generation machine learning algorithms. It's sometimes it's about what are the data sets that are inherent inside those organizations? How do you want to think about what is the data that sits inside both our government, in our private sector, in our public sector? And how do you want to think about a different kind of language? I mean, I kind of rebel against the notion of a race because I think that suggests there's an obvious fixed endpoint where everything is clear and you can determine a winner. I think one of the most interesting lessons we have surely learned from the last 20 years of watching technology unfold is that if you called that race too early, you would have thought Australia was an excellent country for internet uptake and adoption, and also an excellent place for high-speed internet connectivity. I think we might want to ask that question a little bit differently because it turned out that wasn't a 100 meter dash. It was actually a marathon and we're not in such good shape at the 13 mile mark. Mm. Um, I think there are interesting ways of saying, if you want to constitute this as a race, which race is it? I think Sue's right to say there are probably multiple races and thinking about which one we want to compete in. Do we want to be building another tech giant or do we want to be saying we have particular questions inside our national boundaries that ought to be addressed and AI would be useful for them rather than saying should we be building the next tech giant? So for me there's a question about where's the end of the race, which race do you think it is? And to Adrian's point, is that the, is that the most useful metaphor? Because I wonder in saying it's a race, what are the pieces that you'd want to be successful, right? I mean, you know, well, many of us in this room grew up with good Australian race stories. We could have the far lap story, the stall gift story, the Betty Cuthbert story. Like there's lots of stories about what it means to win races. But I think that then undercalls some of the things we are doing well. So if you look at what's been happening using next generation automation in Australian mineral extraction, so both BHP and Fortescue have had really interesting experiments in terms of turning over from human-driven vehicles to autonomous vehicles, and there are real early lessons about what that looks like. It means that Australia is, in fact, at this point, one of the largest deployments of autonomous vehicles on the planet is happening within our shores, right? And we don't actually talk about that when we talk about AI, but we could. So, you know, there's a race where, in fact, we are well at the head of the competition, but it's not the traditional one. So I think, for me, there's a bit about what's the story we want to tell and why, becomes interesting. So that, I'm sorry, well, Sue. I was just gonna add something, I know you wanna move on, but no. um, on, an, on an optimistic note, mm. I mean, Australia is a country of SMEs, and most Australians are employed by small to medium-sized enterprises. And uh, on the plus side, we see a lot of grassroots uh, investment and activity at um, in the AI space, and an example of that is the community uh, up in Queensland, where you know an AI meetup group very rapidly got to more than 2,000 members of people who are interested in having their own AI startups uh, and supporting one another to learn about the latest developments so that they can apply them in their businesses. So that's a positive. 
So how do we take those areas where we are strong, such as autonomous vehicles in mining, and translate that capability into other sectors in order to perhaps build out the new leaders? What's the component that we need to be focusing on then in order to be able to, to spread that knowledge? So I think the first thing is having a point of view. Um, so so impl implicit in the question is we know those things. And I think we have a sense, but I think getting really clear and more directive as a country around where we think we can lead. And then coming off of that is these systems need data. And if you look at the structure of the economy, that strength of SMEs is also our weakness in a sense, because how do you drive data scale um, in, a, in a world full of vertically integrated platforms? How do, how do SMEs um, compete? And if you look at a couple of areas, so let's take health, and um, I'm sitting on the uh, National Genomics Mission Steering Committee. That's fundamentally a machine learning, you know, big data problem, genotype, phenotype, uh, data problem, um, which if we get it right, will restructure the healthcare sector from crisis interrupt driven healthcare to preventative healthcare. But then you go, well actually we've got a population of 25 million people and if you go down to a particular disease vector, you don't have statistically significant sample sizes to be doing interesting things. So that then leads you to, we need to create multilateral, multi-country data sharing agreements for things like anonymized um, genomics data. Um, but there's going to be whole other classes of industries that are going to need to do the same thing. I think we, we, we kind of do it um, in security. Um, but even then, I know, you know Data61, we were approached inside the last six months by another country saying, could we pull our cybersecurity research data? So it, there's a big data piece here that I think um, will need to be more prominent for us to achieve the potential where we identify areas we can be world leading. And I think, but, I mean, I think there's an interesting other thread to that, Adrian, too, right, which is that what it suggests is what it means to be successful in this quote-unquote race isn't just about the technology. It's also about how do we think about our regulatory framework, how do we think about who our partners are, how do we think about what it would mean to imagine pooling data with other countries, other organisations, how do you frame and structure that? And those aren't technical questions, right? They are questions that are also about regulatory frameworks and process and goals. And I think one of the challenges when we keep talking about an AI race is that we keep thinking it's about who's got the best technology rather than saying who has the best point of view was the word you used, but who has the best notion about what the end state might be, who's thinking about this more broadly. Because if you wanted to say, and that's where Stefan was going, right? What does it mean to think about next generation automation? What does it think, mean to think about productivity uplift? That's just not about putting technology into places. That's about how do you change your workforce composition? How do you change your workforce training? How do you think about different skill sets? How do we then think about how goods and services and people all move? And then you realize that winning a race is actually, it involves all the other stuff too, like the training regimes and you know, all the other pieces there. And I think we're not very good at bringing that into the conversation because it makes it both more complicated, but it's more opportunity too. It's systems, um, <laughs> systems thinking, which we're inherently not good at. And it's also, you think about how we got here, we got here through combinatorial innovation, um, data, compute, algorithms coming together, um, miniaturization, um, all of these things coming together. And it, it is important that we get this right and we do have a point of view because right on, right on the edge now, and it's starting to come into focus, is not only bi uh, cyber physical systems, but bio digital systems where we're evolving to be able to you know, pro program life in a sense that uses these underpinnings. So um, the most valuable thing I think we can do as a country is, is have that point of view. So we're talking about something that gets very big very quickly with regard to the complexity of the issue that we're trying to tackle here. And yet yesterday it was discussed that we don't collaborate particularly well in Australia. So to what extent is with that failure? With each other or with others? Sorry? Is it with each other or with others? Uh, do, can you collaborate with yourself? <laughs> Some organisations don't even collaborate in themselves. So There you go. <laughs> so is that part of the issue here, that, that we need to maybe start thinking about some of these broader, more structural, socially structural issues before we can really get onto the right footing to compete? I don't, th I don't think we do ourselves any favour in the way that we partition things into separate industry sectors. So yes, 
you know, we have uh, the mining industry uh, leading the world in uh, the development of autonomous technologies, uh, but how is that information shared across to manufacturing, services such as construction, uh, and other areas where it would be really useful? Uh, we, we actually just don't have good mechanisms for that, and that's leaving aside, you know, whether research and industry collaborates particularly well together. I think it's a bit like the invention of electricity in the late 1800s. This is a technology that cuts across every single... It'll build a... And a lot of Australians got great jobs in the electricity sector, building out our electricity network, which was magical technology at the time. Uh, but it also cut across every single other industry sector and changed how manufacturing, agriculture, mining all worked and enabled them. And I think, I think where we are at with AI is the same sort of uh, shift that's going on. So it does tend to, to cut across. There's a huge upskilling upgrade. But picking up on the earlier discussion, I do think there is this issue of sovereign capability, you know, that, that actually we can't just import a lot of the AI we need. It's getting used in mission-critical infrastructure, defence, cybersecurity applications. And Australia no, does need to think around what are the AI capabilities we need in terms of the hard tech infrastructure and then our skills, like... We think this is a whole new workforce of AI specialists that's got to get built by uh, the year 2030. Uh, and then pretty much most jobs get reshaped and changed. They don't, not as many disappear as we initially thought, but a lot of jobs are reshaped and changed by AI. So we've got to, up, we've got to build an entirely new workforce in machine learning, natural language processing, data science, um, predictive analytics, a lot of subfields of AI. We desperately need more talented people that we do not yet have. So how do we get them? We train them up with Genevieve. <laughs> Genevieve is going to teach them all. Excellent. <laughs> Good. So no pressure then. <laughs> um, listen, I think there's got to be a couple of pieces. One is we do need to start thinking now about what that set of skills will look like. And we know that means not just what happens in universities, but what happens in primary school and secondary school. It's about how do you expose people to both the new technology, but frankly, some of the old systems that we already know you need to do in order to be able to think about many of the things that Stefan rattled off. You actually don't just need to have a technical education and a STEM education. You also actually need to be taught about how to ask critical questions. You actually need to have an awareness about how social systems work, not just technical systems. So I think there's a, you know, an argument for a more integrated education system through high school as well as the university sector. I would say that one of our challenges has been is that we keep thinking that if we just change what we do in that, that fixes everything. And the reality is a whole lot of the people whose jobs will change complexion and composition are not going to go back to a university. So part of it is what's the, the, the role universities need to play in taking what they know and bringing it out to the broader world. So whether it is the kinds of micro-credentialing and micro-educational experiences that Australian universities are deploying, whether it's what Bill Simpson Young is doing with Gradient in terms of education, there's a whole lot of work a whole lot of us need to do to up, just sort of level set the conversation again. And then it's about how do you do on-the-job training? How do we think differently about what skills acquisition looks like? It's a whole broader conversation. And then there's the piece about how do we all educate ourselves as citizens about what all of this means for us? Because I think there's a bigger conversation there too. On that front then, if I look to my colleagues in the media, we often see AI portrayed as the robots will take our jobs. Very quickly moving through to the Terminator will come and kill us. But I'm personally very excited about the Terminator movie coming back with Sarah Connor. Um, but assuming that stays within the realm of fantasy for the moment, do we have an issue here that we just don't really want to talk about it? No. Or that we don't know how to talk about it in such a way that we can actually build the enthusiasm in the community that others want? And so I'll throw that to you, because you mentioned before working with grassroots organisations. So how is that conversation coming about? How is it that perhaps that, that people out in the streets are actually embracing this? Yeah, I think sometimes people, uh, well, uh, the experts in the area do avoid talking about it. I've been in conversations where people have actively tried not to use the word robot because they think there's going to be negative connotations. And I think we may as well shut up shop if we're going to do that. I think we just actually have to get people more familiar with the technology by talking about it. And un unfortunately, I don't think we're very good at telling those stories. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the reason is for that, but yeah, I think we should not be avoiding using that terminology. Uh, we need for people to have, uh, to feel comfortable with it. It's a conversation we need to have. We work with a steel company north of Brisbane called Watkins Steel, a father-son company, been around for about 80 years, and they went from making steel products. And I met a guy who worked on the factory floor doing welding of steel. He left school in grade 10, 
but he had transitioned and the whole company was transitioning. They'd gone from making steel to steel design work and he was sitting in front of two big computer screens. He was off to a tech conference in California for 3D visualization and he got skilled up in graphic design and um, I'm sure AI will start to feature in his job. But it was interesting to me, this was somebody who left school in grade 10 but is benefiting from this AI and digital revolution. And I think that we need to make this real for people like that, you know, that this is not inaccessible. This is a job opportunity and a career pathway. You know, he's got a better salary, he's got a family, things are going well, and the, the, the trans and this company didn't lose a single employee through this transition from steel making, which is a very sort of hard traditional business, through to steel design and technology. And eventually all it will do is steel tech and design work. It won't actually make any steel products within years. So that kind of transition is, is possible and we, we need to look at how it happens. It's part of winning the AI. They, they won the AI race, if you, if you want to look at it that yeah, way. I, I think it's also contextual, contextualizing, right? So um, we, we developed a, uh, you know, a drought map to um, provide decision support tools around investment for water management. Um, or you talk about predictive maintenance or failure prediction for, for water pipes or you know, you talk about um, medical image diagnostics. There's teams doing great work around Alzheimer's. So I think the way that we need to talk about it is in context um, so that um, the general population gets a sense of the benefits that are coming from the technology, not just for technology's sake. But having said that, there has to be a conversation in the country around what's the sovereign technology? Are we investing to push the science forward? Um, in some, of these, in some of these areas as well. General population, if we bring it back to the business community um, and we think about it as a system, um, this economy is undergoing structural change right now. It is. And um, I think there's not a huge window for uh, a lot of our incumbent industry to really think differently about the business that they're in, come back to thinking about the data assets that they have, um, and I think that starts with boards and what sort of questions are boards asking in challenging operating teams in these businesses. And then if you think about it from a systems point of view, you go, well, who are the boards accountable to? Shareholders, who are the shareholders? A lot of the shareholders are big superannuation funds. So there, there's a whole systems opportunity here and I, and I do think and I see firsthand the conversation changing a lot in the last 12 to 24 months in, the, in those sort of environments. We have a productivity dilemma in Australia. Productivity is how much goes into the sausage factory and how much comes out. The efficiency with which we convert inputs to outputs and crucial for long-term wealth creation. Any, any economists will say this, but our productivity growth rates are about half what they have been long-term average and uh, we know we need to double them roughly to see us and our children have the same enjoyment of continued improvement of quality of life. There is nothing that comes into the Australian economy that's new like AI. AI is the thing that is going to see this happen right across all our industry sectors like electricity did in the late 1800s. It's what will lift productivity again. So part of winning this race is this absolute urgency we have to boost industry productivity across all sectors, which means, as Adrian says, it means boards waking up to what it can do and how to do it. But I think then also developing our, ourselves for the year for the future, you know, we're just adopting AI and using it cleverly in our existing industries is an imperative now, but let's not forget how good the world is gonna get at AI. All the investments that are being made in deep R&D capability are gonna build something. I think Australia wants to choose things we're good at. We, you mentioned mining, which we think is definitely one. Agri-tech is another. We are leading the world in AI for the great outdoors, digging, uh, searching, um, planting, doing stuff with dirt. We, we're very good on those sorts of applications with AI and we can start to build whole industries around this as well, but boost existing industry productivity. Well, let me but play to, can sorry, I, can I just put a, a, a small, in the, what, what was the football you said, right? I want to put a flag on the play. Listen, I think it's really easy to be reductive and think about the health of a society only by economic metrics. And I always find myself faintly uneasy that way where we talk about, you know, we will be better because we'll have improved productivity. And productivity gains are one measure of a healthy society, but they're not the only one. And thinking about an entire new set of technical systems that have implications for how we are made sense of, 
how we are seen, how we are received, is part and parcel of the conversation we should be yep. having too. Right? It's not just about economic productivity, it's also about how do we want to think about citizenship, participation, equity. It's also about how do we want to think about what are the implications for technical systems like this for creating things that aren't necessarily strictly about industry or productivity gains, but about how do we want to think about where climate sits in that and sustainability. But I would also have said a whole lot of other things that are slightly more intangible around things that make healthy societies that are about, well, other social things. They're about community building. They're also about things like art and religion and other when, when we looked into the ethics of AI, I became convinced AI is a boon to the criminal justice system, for example. A lot of error that happens via humans in the mm -hmm. criminal justice system, we can actually start to correct via AI, which can work smarter, faster, and to rules better without human bias if we put the right data into it, if we do it well. And you and so I, you and I both know the systems that, that have been that built already we that do, don't do we that. We do, we do, but we've learned from the systems like Compass that didn't work and got corrected, and I think that the injury, we saw the bias in the data and we could correct for it, but legal friends of mine um, do say that this, you know, who know the criminal justice system and the, the failings of human beings in that system, this is a, this is not, so it's not just a chance to uplift productivity, as you say, this is a chance to uplift the quality of the human experience in Australia if we do it well. We can also get it wrong. I want to pause there for a second. In a moment, I'm going to go to the floor. So if you have any questions that are starting to buzz away in your brain, get them ready, because I think we have a roving mic that will be able to come around to you. Before we do that, though, just let me play devil's advocate for a moment, because a lot of what I'm hearing here in discussion about the bright and shiny future of AI in many ways sounds very similar to the stories I was writing at The Australian in the late 1990s about the benefits of digitalization. And yet 20 years later, in a highly digitalized society, we have a productivity slump, wage stagnation, and rising issues with regard to mental health. So how do we avoid that, the perpetration or the, the continuation of that scenario? How do we go about ensuring that as we move through this AI revolution that we don't end up creating something that we didn't really want in the first place? Well, we kind of got here with the internet in a sense, right? Because there wasn't the, the sorts of discussions that Genevieve is alluding to didn't take place. Like there was a sense of, here's this liberating thing called the internet and the network. And then what cropped up was, you know, basically, you know, a surveillance driven advertising model to build socioeconomic profiles. And now we're in a state of unintended consequence from some of that. And so, I, I personally believe it's about having the conversations and I think it's about not underestimating the population to want those conversations and to engage in those conversations and they're domestic conversations. But also in a networked world, you can, you can argue that um, geographic boundaries, they matter, they absolutely matter, they will always matter, but they matter less um, in, in a connected world where you've got other sorts of um, you know, boundaries being drawn that are not geographic boundaries. Could be ideological boundaries, could be, um, you know, could be societal values, um, boundaries, but I think we've got to be having the conversation and a deeper, richer conversation as a country right now. We're in the driver's seat and we've got to, when it comes to technology, we can really shape what it looks like and maybe we didn't do enough of that previously. Uh, well, today, you know, despite all these fantastic new technologies, we're not seeing an even distribution of the benefits. And so we've never had such a wide gap between rich and poor for many, many years. Uh, so I think you can only expect to have less social cohesion and uh, more troubles if we can't somehow bridge that gap. Right. So to the floor then, do we have anyone? I've got a hand up in the middle here. I can't see too off the lights in my eyes, but if we can bring the microphone across. Just we've got another one at the front, so we'll, we'll come to that in a moment, and then I'll be relying on my mic runner to pick out the rest. Go ahead, please. Uh, I would like to ask a very practical question. Oh, I you guess can just let us know who you are and where you're from, too, uh, when you ask a question. Uh, it's Joe. Uh, I'm from Orica. Uh, we are a mining technologies, uh, mining explosives company in Australia. We try to uh, do, um, integrate AI and machine learning to improve the mining efficiency. But uh, regarding the AI and the general situation in Australia, I would like to ask a very practical question. Uh, with this current economic situation in Australia and very weak Australian dollar, how can we convince the tech giants like Google, Amazon to open uh, some of their offices in Australia to, uh, to benefit from the cheap 
labor that they can. Because when you look at Canada, which is our sister country with the same culture and same uh, socialist system, we see that a lot of uh, offices of Amazon and Google are moving to Toronto, for example. Why can't we do the same thing in Australia to create more jobs and opportunities for people who are interested in that and passionate about it, rather than seeing a lot of Australians moving to United States to follow those type of careers. Well, Genevieve, at least Intel invested in Australia by bringing you back here, which was a good thing. But <laughs> Very kind of We had to steal her. Yeah, they got like, <laughs> borrowed. Listen, I think one of the interesting things has been watching the complexion of where big tech companies are putting their next generation hubs. So we see a growing presence of Microsoft in Sydney. Salesforce has just made an announcement this week about where they're going to put people. We see Amazon building up its centers here. And I think that's as much a positive reflection on our education system, on the kind of skills that are here, on about the kind of opportunities there are here. So I, mean, I think there are signs of positive activity. Yeah, and uh, that it, my sense is that is a priority. That is a national priority to attract multinationals here. And there are success stories. So um, Boeing is an example. The biggest R&D um, facility outside of the US is in Australia. Um, CSIRO has a long-standing relationship with Boeing and you know, north, north of $100 million worth of collaborative research um, undertaken together. So um, I think it is shifting. And uh, I, know, I know it's a priority for the country. It's, it's accelerating. It's big in all of our work and it's something I think a lot about too and wonder why. I know Canada had a really purposeful strategy to make that happen and what it's achieved and that's been great. Um, we are seeing it happen a bit internally in Australia. There, If we look at the stock market and we take the ASX 200 and look at the index of performance of all of those and we get the infotech companies like WiseTech, REA Group, uh, Technology One to name a few and car sales would be another one. And we see a split in about 2017, the infotech companies start rising, a bit like NASDAQ and the Dow Jones did uh, sort of 15 years ago. That is beginning, and I think if we look at some of our large tech companies, incredible rapid growth, and it's really quite exciting to see it happen with jobs and salaries going with it as well, it's a, it could be sort of really about to launch and explode. So I think, watch Australia's tech sector, watch our platform companies, I think we're, we're about to see them launch, you know, as of about mid-2017 is when the lines on the graph really start to depart. I'll cover it more in my speech this afternoon, uh, but that is, I think, a really important trend for us to look at. But then we need to start to answer your question and ask why, what conditions do we create here that really attract not just like the pure, the real R&D parts of these companies to set up in Australia and draw upon and build our workforce for advanced digital tech R&D so my kids get good jobs doing this as well. We need to answer that question. Can I just add one more thing? So if, if you look at other parts of the world that are very, very good at creating new industry and turning ideas into products, into companies, into global franchises, um, there's a function um, called product management that doesn't exist as strongly here. And it's an artifact of history that um, a lot of multinationals view Australia as a sales and marketing outpost versus doing primary R&D and product development. And that function is sitting across a deep understanding of technic, technic, what's possible technically, strong technical aptitude, with a point of view of where the market's going and bringing those things together. Um, and it's something that um, I think there's opportunity, more opportunity in the university sector to uh, produce people with those products. I, I really agree. I think Australia does all this amazing research and all the bits and pieces, but never puts them together to create the iPhone, which the customer actually wanted. So uh, being in Syrah for 20 years, that's what I think one of our failings is we do awesome research in all sorts of ways, but no one puts it together into a consumer product. Is, is that how you would see it, Adrian? Does that? I, th I think it's... Um I think it's the integration and the packaging, but it's also thinking about markets, where a market's going. It's thinking about a value chain, where to enter in a value chain. It's thinking about pricing. So with a lot of the new data-driven industry, there's usually elements that are not, you know, you don't charge for them, you give them away. So thinking about, you know, diff different criteria for, for valuation. And I know some of the platform companies, it took a long time for analysts here to understand the differences in, in the businesses and the economics, and they were undervalued and misunderstood. Um, and I think that's turning around as well. 
but uh, lots of opportunity for universities here as well, I think. Great. Question at the front, if we can get the mic. Got it? Where's our microphone going? No, not sure. Microphone's Maybe up there. Chat it out. Just run. Can you yell? Right, yeah, chat out. Go we'll ahead. say it back. But first of all, um, th thank you so much for uh, an erudite and stimulating discussion. Um, my, my question's about ethics, and it's about whether we should be winning the race or running a good race. Um, the, the Human Rights Commission recently um, concluded an inquiry into the ethics of AI, which was, was, I think, probably the first time in the world a Human Rights Commission had done that. Um, Dr. Evatt was the president of the General Assembly when the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was introduced and was, was a, a big proponent of that. Um, do you think Australia can continue to play that sort of game on international stage? Um, the 3A I Institute's doing some of that, thank you. Um, but do you have faith in the current systems of governance to deliver that sort of good race? What a great question, <laughs> and, and yes, I think though the thing is for me, if we look at the metrics of what winning looks like, which is Australians with better quality of life in the future, we got to win the ethics and the tech development all at the same time. We, we you know, that, that, that without ethics, we won't win this race in a genuine sense. We won't end up with, with the, the benefits of AI. So, you know, absolutely crucial. Ethics in itself may become a bit of an industry for us as well, doing ethical AI, People buy AI that is more ethical. I think that putting that into the mix is, is important too. So the two are kind of kind of together, but is is something to be very aware of. And that's you know our first project was on the ethics of AI, and the Australian government will publish some principles around that soon. But you know we've seen it as pretty crucial to winning. And I think one of the challenges there, however, is that ethics is another one of those loaded terms, where the relationship between ethics morality and values on the one hand and ethics standards and policy on the other is a complicated one, right? So what it means to think about something that is ethical or not is actually more contested than it sounds. Uh, I spent a lot of time at Intel where the engineers I work with used to say, just tell us what's ethical, like the five things, we'll just build it. And you're like, okay. <laughs> Let's take a step back there for a moment and say, one of the things about, well, ethical decision making is that often by the time you get to, well, you know, the trolley car problem, it's the what's the least worst choice you could make. And that's not where we want the technology to be, but the preceding set of conversations about what we regard as ethical is not straightforward. Uh, you know, in the arc of our lifetimes in Australia, we have had conversations that spanned what was in the law versus what the population believed was moral versus what some people believed was ethical or not, and those were not simple conversations. In the last 60 years, those have included in Australia the use of the death penalty ideas about death with dignity, ideas about Aboriginal sovereignty, ideas about land rights, ideas about damning the Franklin, all of those were litigated as conversations that were sometimes about values conversations, often about morality, frequently glossed as ethical, and in any single one of those, even at the point that we reached a resolution at law, we didn't have an agreement in the Australian population about what was ethical and what wasn't. And I think one of the really complicated problems we have in talking about AI and ethics is that unbundling that of what is the ethical stance and how does that then relate to both standards, policy and the law is not as straightforward as saying we should have AI and ethics. And frankly, it is one where, and I do think about Doc Everett, and I think about the declaration of both well, the original League of Nations and the human rights framework, and of thinking about what that might have looked like had it started in a society that wasn't driven by the individual, and about what it might mean to imagine different kind of values. Now, the interesting piece about that conversation starting in Australia is that we're one of two countries in the world where there is a conversation about data sovereignty that isn't about sovereignty in the sense that my two colleagues are using it, but in the sense of we have people who've been inhabitants of this country for 60,000 years, and the notion about what is data and what it means to access that provides a completely different way into a conversation about privacy, trust, risk, as well as sovereignty, ownership, and transparency. And there are opportunities there for conversations that are much more interesting in some ways and sophisticated than what's happening. I do think, however, to be responsible, a conversation about AI and ethics actually has to be preceded by a conversation 
about what it is we believe we are as a nation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's an easy conversation and I don't think it's a simple one. And I actually don't think even in this room there would be agreement about what it means to be an ethical Australian in the 21st century. So, to come back to that, how, how do we balance this then? On, on the one hand, we're talking about the need to create a sense of urgency because of the, the wonders that lie ahead of us that we will miss out on if we don't move quickly enough. But on the other hand, if we move too quickly, then we create systems and processes and unintended consequences. So, it how do we balance it out? It wouldn't be the first time we've said we didn't want to move with undue haste, right? Let's think about how we manage new medical technologies. Let's think about how we think about certain kinds of forms of biosecurity. Let's think about how we think about certain kinds of drug regimes on the one hand. On the other hand, we know what happens in Australia when you move hastily and do it because everyone else does it. You end up with rabbits and then cane toads. Cane toads. <laughs> and then goats and cows. That wasn't Syro cane toads. We got blamed for it. No, and I know, was, in fact, in fact, yeah. Syro gave delightful advice to the government yeah, organisation. not to do it. Yeah, they well, yeah, And then everyone thought it, it was us. Yeah. yeah, no, indeed. But, you know, we know, we know what happens when you introduce something because then you go, ah, oh, it'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> but, so Google company DeepMind in, approached the National Health Service in the United Kingdom with a machine learning algorithm that they were going to trawl through people's private uh, health records that could be used to predict acute kidney injury, which is if something you have, if there's something wrong with one of your kidneys you want to know, you can manage a condition and that can save your life potentially. So it's really important, really useful. But the NHS pulled them up and said, no, you have not got permission from all these people to use their private data. Now, the algorithm was just going to trawl over it, and as far as I could tell, there was no risk to any exposure or incorrect use of people's private data, but it was held back. The consequence is probably some people are going to get dead because they don't know they have an acute kidney injury, and we could have done it. So holding back had another ethical consequence as well, and I think that's where we can't just say, let's hold back because it could be unethical. By doing that, we actually have a cost in somewhere else. AI, I'm convinced in cancer diagnosis, for example, if AI can be used, we don't even need AI, we just need basic data analytics actually to start saving human life in Australia with cancer diagnosis, doing it earlier. Um, but you know, if we hold back on it, we prevent those positive outcomes as well. So there's trade-offs, it's not sort of that we can sort of say, let's hold back and wait till we're sure it's ethical. There's really positive applications we can make with AI in Australia right now. And right there is the classic case that any philosopher will tell you is what an ethical dilemma looks like. Of how do you, no it is, and it's, it's exactly the right piece of how do you then imagine a trade-off between two outcomes, neither one of which is unambiguously good. And thinking about what an ethics framework is, isn't just about stating a series of principles that you agree are all, you know, are all wonderful and good. It's also about what do you do in a situation where you're making that trade-off. I was wondering how long it would take us to get to the trolley problem. And if you haven't watched the series called The Good Place, I'd definitely recommend yeah. you do so. Adrian. And also, if we take this to the next step, so let's posit that we agree, right? There's, there's a, an agreement in principle on things. Um, then how do you encode that in systems? And that's where you've got, you know, Australian groups like the Gradient Institute that are um, starting to develop tools to visualise the trade-off decisions and make them explicit. Um, and there, I think Australia has an opportunity in developing those sort of uh, those sort of tools. So you're at the Actually, can you still say coalface? Are we still allowed to say that word? You're at the coalface when it comes to the development of cyber-physical systems. Carbon neutral coalface. Carbon neutral coalface. <laughs> Clean coalface, whatever, okay. <laughs> the solar face. Brand anyway, coalface. Um, where do these considerations sit then in terms of the research programs that you develop? At what point do you start having discussions with your researchers about ethical consequences of the work that you're doing? Well, I guess we can't do any work that's going to impact on people without having formal ethics clearance, mm. so that's uh, often quite a, it can be quite a long and complicated process to get approval from ethics committees to be able to conduct that research. Mm. So it has to be very central to mind when developing these things. Can that then be scaled out? We talked before about the fact that many of the world's most valuable companies are private sector organisations who are not necessarily so well regarded when it comes to the ethical outcomes of the work that they've done. Is there some chance then perhaps we can take the learnings we already have from the research sector and apply that in the commercial world? Yeah, well, I, I think so. I Has it been done? Genevieve, have you ever seen that work? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of obviously large global companies who are starting to think through a set of technical systems that had potential that none of them imagined. I mean, it's an interesting proposition, right? If you were 20 years ago building a tech company that you thought was solving a very narrow band problem, I'm going to deliver things that can be flat packed 
which was the Amazon value proposition. Right? When Bezos initially made that company, it was, I will sell things that you can stick in an envelope. So it was sort of like, what can I flat pack? That was his kind of you know, starting proposition. Flash forward more than 20 years, that is a company that has a physical and digital footprint in at least 50% of American homes and many more globally. What it means to go from a company that thought they were selling things you could stick in an envelope to a company that effectively has an object that can listen to 50% of the activity, 50% of American homes is a very different kind of end point. Mm. And I think for companies like Amazon and Google and Facebook, but also companies like Microsoft, IBM, Intel, all those companies have been grappling for the last couple of years with how it is that you want to frame those conversations up, both in terms of how do you start to have a conversation about what are the consequences and unintended and otherwise of your technology? And then also the other questions, which I think are equally complicated inside government and inside the public sector, about if you decide you have a, an ethical guideline or an ethical set of principles or a principle about those things, who's enacting them? Who's held accountable? What's the chain of reporting that that goes up into? What are the consequences of violating that? Where are the conversations gonna get staged when you get to a moment where you're training things off to Stefan's point. And I think we've been very good at articulating the beginning of that piece. We're not so good at starting to think through where would those uh, things I think come. we need scenario planning, and I don't think Facebook had in its uh, in imagination what would happen with Cambridge Analytica in the US election and its eventual Australian $7 billion fine that got leveled against it. You know, those sorts of outcomes weren't really being envisaged, but were almost, there was some sense of inevitability once the, the power and the size of the tool they created and what would get done with it. So I think we need to start to generate scenarios around these emerging technologies to try and think about these things earlier and maybe get better outcomes. And I suspect there's also a call here. This is not just about how do you change the conversations in industry. I think it's about how do you change the conversations in government too. What does it mean to think about upskilling our regulators, our policymakers, and our politicians to have these conversations too. Great. We might go back to the floor then. I saw one hand go up, but yep. I can't see uh, the light, so Peter, go ahead. Hi, it's uh, Peter Carney. I, I, I work for Toll, which is a logistics company, and um, not just for Toll, but for Australian companies generally. <laughs> Who's missing from management? You know, who, who do we need extra in the team to sort of be able to take advantage of all these great developments? How do we, what conversations should we be having and who should we be collaborating with? If you had a chance to influence Australian companies, what would you say? We work with Australian companies a lot and we get the, you know, we've heard of this thing called AI and data science. We know it really matters, we've got a strategy, but then it starts to get really blurry about what's actually happening. And our response is really to start to improve. We're working on a data-driven organizations paper which tries to look at what a data-driven enterprise does, what it looks like, what its capabilities are and how it works. But we're trying to put evidence and uh, sort of explain what what these uh, business models look like that actually work in this world. So there's, a, there's an education challenge ahead of us to try and give them the next level of detail so that they can actually make these technologies work in their businesses. I think there's a preceding problem too, which is about how do you ensure you have the greatest diversity of voices in the room? I think that you know some of the pieces that Adrian was flagging earlier about challenges with data sets in particular, but also the whole future we are moving to. I know that it's not just about having people who are good at data science or tech or foresight, all of which are excellent things to have. It's not just about having all of those in the room, it's about how do you have a set of voices in the room that represent a more broad set of lived experiences and backgrounds and disciplinary practice because frankly you actually need to have the people who are going, huh, that, I have no idea of that thing that you've just said. The challenge with that I will say having run those kind of organizations in my time in the US is the more diversity you have in the room, the harder you have to work to manage the inevitable conflict that comes with it. It's one of the things we never talk about when we talk about having diverse voices in the room is that you actually have to work on the inclusion piece too because as soon as you have people who come from different backgrounds, you don't have the same shared shorthand, you don't have the same shared frame of reference and it's really easy then to either argue just for the sake of it or not listen and I think one of the challenges we actually have in any workforce of the future, in any management team of the future, is how you actually create the space to have the kind of conversations that are necessary, which actually means having a whole lot of voices in the room who aren't usually there that people don't know how to listen to. And so the not just having more voices, but having a set of practices that are better at making space for them is an interesting part and parcel of the challenge we're facing. 
And I think it's um, everybody's responsibility in a manage management and leadership team to lift their digital literacy. It's not about plugging in a digital expert. Having said that, um, I was having a conversation in the last week with one of the big global recruiting firms who was saying, if you think back um, in the last five or 10 years, the path to a CEO for a big multinational incumbent company was usually, the CEO was usually through the CFO. So you do a stint as a CFO around the world, you get moved around and you, you're in pole position to be the CEO, saying that's not the case. The case now is it's, call it a chief digital officer, call it somebody who's responsible for growth, um, usually M&A, probably marketing and brand as well. That function is the fast path to leadership. Um, and what they were saying was that in the past, you'd build a 20, you know, methodical 20 year career collecting experiences. Now there's a sense from incumbents that there's, a, there's an urgency that there's structural change going on in their industry, there's competition coming laterally, they don't have time. And so you've got people who can collect the right set of experience over, over a short period and then kind of zoom straight to, to that, that position in big, big global companies. So. Good, and that just brought us to the point where my little countdown clock has turned red and got angry with us. So that tells us that we need to wrap this up. So ladies and gentlemen, if you could please join me in thanking my fantastic group of panelists today, Adrian Kennedy, Stephen and Sue. I'll be back a little bit later to host another panel looking more deeply in some of the issues around AI for social good. But for the meantime, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Two, two things. Thank you, Sue. I want to know what